welcome to the Innocence Abroad podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Yael Ososki. Uh, Innocence Abroad is a podcast on life and society abroad, and we have a great guest today. We have uh, Pratik Trugali, who is here to talk about one of his articles that he published uh, that I found very interesting, Peace is Passe, Why the Pacifist Movement Died. Now, Pratik, uh, before I, I let him speak and introduce himself a little bit to the audience, uh, he's a researcher, he's a political consultant, and he was previously an executive editor at the American Conservative, as well as the managing editor of the National Interest, where this article first appeared. He's dabbled into politics as a policy coordinator for a Republican campaign, and he was a Bush-era appointee at the State Department. He holds a JD from the Yale Law School, and he's writing a book currently about American universities in the Middle East. So Pratik, thank you so much for taking the time, good sir. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I, I wanted to get into the article. I think it's interesting. It's uh, definitely something that is top of mind for uh, a lot of people who listen to this program. And it's the idea of looking at how we engage with the idea of war and conflict and whether having peace movements is something that we should focus on, we should put our energy on. And what you kind of mention in your article is that there's this uh, to use the foreign policy cliche of a vacuum, uh, there's now this vacuum of a kind of peace movement. And uh, you kind of go through the history, and I, I wanted to just ask, you know, from the beginning, what kind of prompted you to write this? Was it seeing what's happening with President Trump? Was it uh, the responses that you're seeing in media? Kind of what inspired you to take on this, this certain angle of the story? Sure, well, the immediate genesis for the article was, was when I was watching the Democratic debate, particularly the last one where you did have foreign policy feature uh, in the debate in a way that it hadn't uh, up till this point. Now, you did have a degree of disagreement on foreign policy normally, uh, uh, particularly with Tulsi Gabbard and others who were questioning um, the prudence of certain inter military interventions that we've had. Um, but one of the things that struck me is that even with the diversity of views that you had on the Democratic side, um, None, none of the candidates were really offering a principled uh, opposition to the use of military force. It was always uh, prudential decisions and objections. And in fact, um, when it did come to the question of military force, even the candidates who were relatively uh, dovish were echoing many of the, uh, I would call them cliches at this point, about the importance of military service and the nobility of our troops and, and the, the high of deference that our uh, military uh, were receiving, all, all of that struck me as quite surprising, not because they're necessarily unreasonable positions, but because they strike me as being rather uh, incongruent given the experience that we've had with our military interventions over the past um, decade or so. And, and so I began to think, well, you know, is this an anomaly or is this how we've always been throughout the 20th century? And I began to look at um, whether or not we've had any kind of a robust uh, pacifist movement or any kind of a movement in the past that objected to military interventions in war, not only because they didn't see the strategic value in it, but also because they had some kind of a moral opposition uh, to the use of force. Hmm. And, you know, you, you do mention in the article the different campaigns of uh, presidential candidates over the years. You talk about Barack Obama and uh, Ron Paul. And, you know, it's it was always kind of the tried and true notion that whomever was anti-war, usually, uh, that was put up there uh, would win, at least in, in modern times. And do you see now in 2020 that this is an advantageous position to be talking more about peace, or is it more just kind of caught up in what the role of the military should be, or is it now just a critique of the kind of Trump-esque foreign policy, whatever that might be? Well, the Trump years are interesting because there's a, a great deal of volatility now, and there are actually a few different paths, uh, all of which are uh, presumably politically viable that the president could be attacked on. Uh, I think one might be to run uh, as a more interventionist uh, candidate and attack Trump for his weakness and bumbling on foreign policy. And uh, there's a great deal of legitimacy to that argument now, given how he handled the withdrawal uh, of troops from uh, the Kurdish areas and how he's handled an array of foreign policy challenges. I think that even those who, who would favor some degree of American have to look uh, 
uh, at the way Trump has handled our alliances, has handled any number of conflicts, and, and really question whether or not this is a time or way uh, to retrench from the world. Now, at the same time, I think that the many of the traditional uh, reasons why people elect conservative politicians, namely to rein in deficits, uh, to exercise a degree of uh, fiscal and economic prudence, um, all of these have gone out the window uh, with the Trump administration. You've seen just an extraordinary degree of discretionary spending. Uh, and I think that there is a room here to offer a critique of whether or not our defense budgets are too large and whether or not they're proportional, um, given the nature of the challenges we have in the world. And I think there's a strong argument to make here that we're uh, far too over-reliant uh, on the military and that there's uh, a tremendous degree of imbalance, both in terms of uh, how we're exercising and also just broadly the relation of our military to our other uh, federal priorities. And um, I, I hate to use a kind of socialist uh, argument about militarism, but you kind of mentioned that in the article that we have obviously a military um, pretty large of civilian size, yet there's so much of our also civilian workforce that's tied into the military be it contract, building of planes, uh, reliance and maintenance on bases. You know, there's this huge relationship between the private economy, if we can call it that, and the military, that it is so entrenched with the economy that if you were to really talk about changing any of that, that would directly impact a lot of jobs and communities and industries, right? I remember that argument from uh, living in the Tampa, St. Petersburg area when they're talking about the Air Force base there. And any notion or talk about it closing down was always about, well, think about the jobs of the thousands of people who work there every day, who provide the catering, the electricians. It's not just something that you can do you know, overnight. You know, is there some degree to which our economy is now so intertwined with this kind of uh, robust you know, military uh, might that we really have no way of changing that without significant impact? Yeah, that was one of the findings of my article, that as I looked at the history of the pacifist movement throughout the 20th century, uh, my argument would be that it basically peaked with the Vietnam War, where you had uh, broad-based opposition to the conflict in Vietnam. And uh, among this broad-based anti-war movement, you did have uh, pacifist movements uh, having an outsized role in that. Now, the question is, why did it peak in Vietnam and what happened after that? And I think a big part of that is the way that our uh, political leaders changed the relationship between the military and the broader defense industry and the American people. Uh, so there were a couple of big things that happened here. One is that the uh, obviously getting rid of conscription, uh, getting rid of the draft. And so with the advent of an all-volunteer army, um, in addition to having people joining the military voluntarily, uh, the burden of our wars on our political elites and our upper class uh, diminished to a great extent. Um, the other big thing that happened, which you were alluding to, is the fact that um, so much of our defense industry basically became part of the broader social safety net that we have in this country. Um, we don't think of it in that way, but when you think of how many um, jobs, how many careers are tied up directly or indirectly, in the economy. Um, one of the remarkable things about this is that in the past, when you had people involved in the military or defense industry in varying capacities, um, there was always a degree of ambiguity or moral doubt about whether or not participating in the military was in some way akin to uh, stoning problematic American military interventions abroad. And this line of critique was very effective in, for example, getting uh, ROTC uh, training off uh, Ivy League campuses. But today, one of the remarkable things is that even during a very high pe uh, period of military intervention in Afghanistan and Iraq and the broader war on terror, um, many of the most expensive and involved uh, things that our defense industry is spending money on actually have nothing whatsoever to do with these conflicts. And I mentioned as an example, uh, the F-35 fighter, which you know, whatever you think of it, it, it basically had nothing to do whatsoever with our conflicts in the Middle East. Um, and yet you have just enormous numbers of uh, jobs and money and plants uh, scattered all over the country. So you have this whole uh, a significant sector of our civilian economy who are working on these kinds of uh, projects. 
advocates for the military. They feel neural ambiguity, whatever their views are about these conflicts. And, uh, and were we to withdraw those suddenly, there would be a great deal of potentially uh, economic and social un uh, upheaval. Was it not the case that Trump was, uh, he actually specifically mentioned the F-35 program? I know when he was running for president, he had mentioned at some point that there's a lot of waste and something about contractors and a little bit about the procurement process. It's as if there, there was kind of hinting. I don't know if that was, uh, I'd be interested in what you think about that. I don't know if it was signaling to perhaps anti-war people who might have come from the left that he wanted to engage with. Uh, what do you think that was about when Trump mentioned that in the early part of his campaign? Well, there's a lot to dislike about the F-35. I mean, so much so that even for a lay audience, the F-35 has now become a sort of poster child for defense waste. Um, so it's not terribly surprising that, that, that uh, insofar as Trump wanted to say opposition to uh, not only military interventions, which he did run on to some degree, but also to government reform, to cronyism, uh, that sort of thing, the F-35 is an obvious target. Now, I have to say that Trump, although he didn't fully follow through on this vein of his campaign, he did actually, if you look at the Pentagon budget um, the, that the administration proposed, they actually uh, asked for fewer F-35s than what Congress ultimately allotted. And I think the only way to really uh, understand that is the fact that Congress has a stake in the F-35 program that is somewhat divorced from the uh, realities of our uh, foreign policy needs abroad. And when um, Trump pulled our troops from Syria, and if uh, any of the listeners or viewers remember, uh, Barack Obama did say at the time when he was president, there will be no boots on the ground at all in Syria. It was a big promise of the administration that we wouldn't be committing any American lives there. Uh, lo and behold, I don't know how those boots got on the ground, but they got there. And when Trump uh, announced his Syria pullout, there was this kind of widespread condemnation. And it was, as you mentioned earlier, it wasn't just about you know, the philosophy behind it. It was mostly like a critique of process. It was like, well, you're moving the troops there. You should actually put them there. And we had a lot of these debates during the Iraq War. I remember that. And John McCain uh, was one of the biggest proponents of this. He would always be there fighting the point. And it was never about whether or not we should be there in the first place, as a true pacifist would do. It was more about, well, we actually should have done the surge earlier, so we should have sent in, whatever, 60,000 troops to this city instead of that. Do you think it's, it's changed now so that the mainstream is all about just the process of how we conduct these operations rather than questioning whether we should be there in the first place? Yeah, well, there are a number of points here, which I get into in the article as well that we talked about with the post-Vietnam reforms. I think a major uh, consequence of that that is not widely appreciated is that it also changed um, who our foreign policy elite is and who our foreign policy establishment is. So one of the consequences of having a large uh, defense industry is the fact that these revenues, these enormous revenues that are coming into our defense contractors and so forth, they don't remain in the realm of fighter jets and whatever else, they also end up financing think tanks, they finance PR firms, um, lobbyists, and also even in academia, there's an enormous amount of money that comes directly or indirectly um, through not only uh, defense and military organs, but other uh, donors and, and people who become wealthy one way or the other um, in, through the national security of state, if you want to call it that. And so one of the consequences is that people who want to have a career in foreign policy and defense, uh, inclinations are or intuitions are about foreign policy. They end up going from a K through 12 system through an undergrad uh, curriculum where you know, there's an emphasis on the centrality of military force. Um, they work at think tanks that are broadly comfortable with military intervention. They end up becoming part of uh, social networks that you know, provide patronage and networks, and all of which ultimately culminates in the people who are managing our foreign policy, who have an outsized role in our foreign policy, uh, having intuitions and views on military intervention. Um, one that I would argue are actually out of step with uh, the broader array of options that our policymakers actually have to deal with these conflicts. Uh, but two, they're, they're intuitions that are to some degree out of step with the American people. Um, but in the absence of a large grassroots movement or a popular movement to resist this, 
uh, elites have a great deal of uh, maneuvering that and they can do, you know, which gives the lead to deploy force. Yeah. And do you think that the, uh, the those who would be pacifist, uh, do you think they've been perhaps caught up in other social movements, whether it be climate change, uh, there was the pro-science uh, march some years ago, the Women's March. Is it just that we are now collectively debating all these other issues that perhaps pacifism or peace is just not put at the forefront of what many activists care about? Yeah, I I speculate on that a little bit in the article. I think part of this is that uh, even candidates who have run on a broadly uh, if not outright anti-war platform, have uh, at least are questioning the uh, prudence of our military interventions. They've chosen uh, to portray themselves as being you know, anything but pacifists. So whether you know, both uh, Rand Paul, uh, sorry, well, yeah, Rand and Ron Paul, as well as Barack Obama, uh, um, explicitly that they're not pacifists, and they either call themselves realists or, or non-interventionists or whatever else, but they you know, for a variety of reasons, avoided uh, that label and that stigma. And in fact, even I, I was, as I was doing the research, um, even Marianne Williamson, who I would argue her personal brand allows her a, quite a bit of leeway on this issue, um, she put together, I, I thought, a fairly interesting proposal on a, um, a new department of, of peace. This has been, the idea has been around for a long time. But even she actually, uh, explicitly said in an interview that she's not a pacifist and she went on talking about the military service and her family. Um, so a big part of this is that for whatever reason, the Overton window on this issue has simply shifted. Um, but I do actually think that there's room to revive this. And I think the, the reason is that if you look outside of the foreign policy, national security space, uh, there is evidence that we're at least important in the segment, are really beginning to question the use of force. And I mentioned a couple examples. I think criminal justice reform, uh, th this debate is very much intertwined with the broader morality of punitive sanctions. Um, also in areas like child rearing and parenting, which seem to be a bit divorced, but when you look at movements like attachment parenting and other uh, areas where parents are really beginning to question whether or not you know, it's okay to discipline your kids in certain ways, these are the kinds of areas that I think could over time translate into new thinking uh, on foreign policy. And wasn't it, didn't, didn't uh, Dennis Kucinich, when he ran for Democratic presidential nomination, didn't he also have the idea for Department of Peace? That sounds right. I'd have to go yeah. look it up. I think so. I remember that for some, I remember thinking it was awesome back then. So, and yeah. at one point you make in there that um, I've discussed, and this is in the very end of your article, you, you talk about um, the, prolifer the proliferation of peace studies programs across U.S. universities is opening the door to pacifist perspectives and providing a counterpoint to the orthodoxies of security and area studies. Uh, I think that's, that's something that's very important. Obviously, in the universities, that's where we form a lot of our opinions. Uh, when people learn about the Bush doctrine or the Madison doctrine or any of these things, it kind of primes us for always thinking that there has to be some kind of war strategy um, that's sort of put out there. What hope do you have for young people especially that this kind of attitude might change or there might be some kind of alternative? Obviously, a lot of people um, who are interested in this show are living abroad. Uh, they get to interact with people from different countries all the time. Um, maybe if you were to do a poll, they would be broadly more pacifist than others. I'm not sure. Uh, I would probably venture a guess. What do you think is, is kind of the, the positive movements that you can see of, of people who might be questioning the broader trend of militarism or robust foreign policy, as it were? Well, look, I, there's an important point here, which is that the, whatever one's intuitions are on, on pacifism and military force, there, there's no guarantee whatsoever that pacifism is necessarily going to lead to um, Better, you know, better, but even more moderate outcomes. And one of the ironies uh, of this debate, oddly enough, is that uh, the movements and the people around the world who have, in many ways, been at the forefront of uh, turning pacifist intuitions into a coherent strategy are actually some of the most illiberal uh, groups in the world. I think one of the ironies is that, um, in many cases, those who have adopted uh, nonviolent conflict, nonviolent strategies of uh, of uh, engagement actually have decidedly illiberal views. I don't think the Muslim Brotherhood has any uh, particular... I do have one more question, and that is about yeah. 
um, thinking of some of the groups, and you mentioned, you know, sort of pacifist movements. Uh, one, one, one of them that I'm very interested in, I was reading a lot about, is, is when Trump used the word America first, or used the statement, and that was in the inauguration address. And when you went back and kind of looked at it, you saw that uh, America first is not a new term invented by Trump. There's actually a whole committee, and uh, parts of it headed up by Charles Lindenberg back in the day. That itself was trying to advocate against the U.S. intervening in World War II. Um, do, what kind of revisiting that or, you know, your own thoughts on it, do you think that's kind of interesting, this parallel with Trump using America first, with this kind of America first of uh, the Second World War and not trying to intervene in the conflict in Europe? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, uh, that was one of the things that I never quite understood of all terms to try to revive why he was went for America first, given that in many ways, if you look at the rhetoric and the argument that um, our bipartisan interventionist elite makes, they, they make the argument quite credibly um, that America first was, became uh, enveloped with many of the uglier sides of our uh, history. And, and one of these was the fact that I think many who identified with the America first movement were uh, anti-Semitic. I think they, they didn't recognize the gravity of the threat uh, in Europe with fascist movements and so forth. Um, so it was a peculiar thing to revive. Um, but one of the things that I did find in my article is that when you look at the rise and decline of the pacifist movement, um, throughout, throughout really beginning with uh, World War I, you had these periods where you had broad-based, robust pacifist movements. Um, they ended up losing in many cases, the, the country did ultimately opt to go into World War One, but then as public questioned these interventions, you had a revival of the pacifist movement. And and I wasn't surprised about the World War One experience, but I was actually surprised when I found that even World War Two, um, which we now view to be this uh, a great sort of victory for the U.S., the decisive conflict, um, you did have actually a, a quite an active uh, pacifist movement that was questioning World War Two. This came out of, uh, in many cases, the uh, the people who were conscripted in World War II who ended up organizing as radical pacifists. And these weren't fringe people. They actually ended up, uh, in one case, winning a Nobel Prize for their relief work. Um, you know, so, so one of the anomalies of our current period is that we haven't really, to the same degree, followed this period of intervention, followed by questioning, followed by a revival of the pacifist movement. This happened with World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam. But after Vietnam, we have and uh, seen the same thing happen. We didn't really, we didn't, you would argue that we didn't have the same thing after Iraq. I mean, there were protests a lot. I mean, if uh, you remember the Michael Moore film, Fahrenheit 9-11, he kind of brings up that point of, you know, there were marches all over the world. They just weren't broadcast on American media. Um, I'm not sure what you think about that. Well, there, there were certainly movements and, and so forth questioning uh, whether or not to intervene in Iraq. And I think that many of the arguments that they made before the war, actually, you know, in fact, I would even say one of the ironies is that if you look at even the predictions of the real fringe anti-war people about how badly Iraq would turn out, uh, even they didn't actually quite uh, realize the magnitude of the error. I mean, I don't remember even the most anti-war people in Iraq predicting that a group even worse than Al-Qaeda would end up emerging from the war and taking significant parts of not only Iraq, but the broader neighborhood. But I, I would argue that the, uh, the anti-war movement, I don't remember significant parts of the anti-war movement uh, actually adopting an explicitly pacifist message in the way that we saw in prior periods. And I think a big part of that has to do with the fact that um, the anti-war movement generally, uh, pacifists or not, um, was underrepresented among the elite. Like I remember when you, when you looked at the authorization of force in 2002, the vote in Congress, um, this was a genuinely bipartisan affair. There was a, a very high number of uh, both Democrats and Republicans who got behind um, this resolution. And I thought at the time that it might be, there might be an element of political cynicism or, or uh, whatnot involved in this vote, just in the sense that they were making a calculation that they didn't want to get on the wrong side of another successful uh, military operation. 
participation as many on the left did after uh, in 91. But I think as we saw with the evolution of the, the fact that John Kerry ended up getting the nomination in 04, um, the way Barack Obama conducted his foreign policy, um, the fact that Hillary Clinton, again, was able to get the nomination, that I think hawks and interventionists are actually in the mainstream of the Democratic Party. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we see that with a lot of the debates and the smearing of uh, Tulsi Gabbard uh, now brought to the extreme, someone who just kind of has gone through war, has experienced it, and when talks about ending foreign regime change war, is just lambasted, it seems. And that's mostly happening within the Democratic Party. You know, it seems as if Republicans are just kind of waiting that whole thing out to see kind of who, who wins the battle, right? You know, the interesting thing about Gabbard, and I'm, uh, I mean, the, this whole notion about ties to Russia or whatever, I'm somewhat open-minded uh, on this only because I, I just, I have to think that Clinton is, all things considered a, a disciplined uh, person. I don't think she just instinctively throws out wild conspiracy theories when she's a secretary of state. I mean, if she's going out there and raising these theories, I mean, I'm, I'm at least open-minded that there might be something going on. But uh, on, the, on the broader message that Gabbard has, I am struck by how she's been vilified in the sense that what she's arguing doesn't strike me as particularly uh, out of the mainstream. I mean, I, I think that you know, one could have a legitimate debate about her points, but if her basic argument, as I understand it, is that um, military service is a perfectly reasonable course of action, she, she seems to be quite proud of her military service, uh, that we do need a strong military defense. But if her, if her main gripe is about these regime change wars, as she calls them, um, it doesn't, given the experience in Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and some of these other conflicts, it just seems like a critique that would be, uh, or ought to be considered beyond the pale, given how things have transpired. And the fact that she is being treated like this uh, speaks volumes about how far our foreign policy elite has gone down this vein. Definitely. Well, we can, we can hope for revival of, of more of this, if not a broader pacifist movement, at least ideas being picked up by others. The article is Peace is Passé, Why the Pacifist Movement Died. Uh, you can read that on National Interest or even in Yahoo. It was syndicated there. Uh, we've been speaking with Pratik Choguli. Uh, he's a researcher and political consultant. Uh, Pratik, where can people find your other written work, videos, and anything else that you're contributing to? Um, well, all my work is uh, on my website. Uh, it's my name, PratikChogli.com, and I'm also on uh, Twitter. You can find me there. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Pratik. Uh, we'll put your website in the show notes and uh, hope to follow up with you very soon. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.